Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. I can see the numbers going up now. Um, we're just gonna wait um, a minute or two to make sure everyone's joined. Um, and if I can just remind people to keep their mics on mute um, apart from our panelists, that would be great. Um, and another reminder that we'll have um, a Q&A session at the end. So if while we're discussing, um, you think of a question that you'd like to direct to one of our panelists, please put it in the chat box um, and we'll get to that at the end. Um, so let's start. Um, welcome everyone. My name's Abby Munro and I'm a research analyst at Walk Free. Um, we're a human rights group focused on ending modern slavery in all its forms. And I'm so happy to be here today um, on behalf of Fashion Revolution USA to moderate this really important conversation. So thank you all for tuning in and joining this new series. Um, it's called Fashion Citizenship, and it's a virtual panel program uh, where we hope to share exciting bills, policies, um, and dive into the legislative landscape that's shaping the state of fashion. Um, and I thought I'd start by giving a bit of background to um, human rights and modern slavery in the fashion industry. So. Today, over 40.3 million people live in modern slavery. And what we mean by modern slavery is situations of exploitation that a person can't refuse or leave. Um, and that could be because of threats, violence, coercion, deception, or abuse of power. Um, and the garment industry has a long and deadly history of forced labor, wage theft, illegal hours, and dangerous conditions. So I can say to all of you with absolute certainty that modern slavery could be as close as the shirt on your back. And let's be very clear, companies in the garment industry have a responsibility to uphold the human rights of all workers in their supply chains. And where there are breaches, it's their responsibility to identify them, to remediate them and to prevent them from happening again. So today in this panel, we'll be exploring mandatory human rights due diligence, as well as other human rights frameworks and legislations that are seeking to address these issues. Um, and at the core of this conversation, we hope to show why human rights legislation in the fashion industry in particular is necessary and what's being done to protect workers and the people who make our clothes. So joining us today, you'll see our esteemed panelists. Um, who I'd like to now invite to introduce themselves. So, um, Noor, perhaps we can start with you. Sure. Thanks, Abby. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Noor Hamade. I'm the Advocacy Council with the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable. I've been with ICAR for a little bit over a year, and ICAR is a coalition of NGOs, primarily in the US, but also around the world working to address uh, human rights and labor rights abuses throughout the supply chains of US companies and identify the ways that companies in the US uh, exploit workers as well as other vulnerable communities and identify ways to prevent them from doing so. Great, thank you, Noor. Um, and Sarah? Hi everyone, great to be here. Uh, my name is Sarah Dadush and I'm a law professor at Rutgers Law School in New Jersey, although at this very moment I am in London. And um, I am the also, um, in addition to being a law professor, I, I am the founding director of a program on business and human rights law at Rutgers Law School. And one of the um, initiatives that we are uh, advancing as part of our program work is to improve um, the human rights performance of global supply chains by improving international contracts uh, for the supply of, uh, for example, apparel products um, between fashion brands and uh, developing country-based suppliers. Great, thank you. Um, and Sahiba. Hi everyone, great to be here. Um, my name is Sahaba Gill. I'm a staff attorney at Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum. Um, as you can tell from our name, um, GLJ ILRF is a new merged organization that really brings um, strategic capacity to work across a variety of sectors, including the fashion industry, on global value chains and migration corridors. Um, and we um, work 
closely really on campaigns that support um, grassroots organizations to um, you know, fight for workers in global supply chains, including fashion. And just recently we signed um, an enforceable brand agreement with Asia Floor Rage Alliance and Tamil Nadu um, Common Labor and Textile Union in um, Tamil Nadu in Southern India um, that will help uh, TCCU a union um, and its members combat gender-based violence and harassment at several factories, um, garment factories in Tamil Nadu. Great. Well, it's great to have you all here as panelists. We've got so much expertise to, to learn from today. So thank you for joining us. Um, so let's kick off the panel um, with learning a little more about the current policy landscape, because it's a really exciting and critical time in relation to, to human rights policy um, and, and particularly in the, the fashion industry. So why are there so many new laws and policies focused um, in this area at the moment, particularly around corporate accountability and, and human rights? Um, over to any of you. I can kick us off. Uh, um, and say that you know one one reason why I think we're seeing a, a proliferation of um, legislation dealing with human rights due diligence in particular is that there is a, a deep uh, recognition that self regulation has failed uh, that voluntary initiatives are not uh, getting us to where we want to be in terms of actually improving uh, corporate conduct and improving um, respect for human rights across supply chains. Um, and so we've tried, you know, decades now of voluntary initiatives and measures um, and seen that there just isn't enough teeth there uh, to, to actually improve, in, improve corporate conduct. And, um, and this, I think some part of this, and I'm very curious to, to hear how others uh, on the panel feel about this, but my sense is that COVID accelerated uh, in, in some sense, you know, revealed, you know, how, uh, how problematic and how unfair um, global supply chains are with respect to, to human rights and accelerated the call for, for binding um, hard law uh, solutions to these problems. I would totally agree with that. I think, um, you know, in 2011, um, the UN put forward these guiding principles on business and human rights, which really, you know, created the due diligence framework that we're now seeing implemented in legislation. Um, and that itself was the result of a long fight for over a decade, you know, to try and get some norms at the international um, level around corporate accountability, because, um, you know, international supply chains operate in a context of very, very little regulation. Um, and that's really the way that, you know, um, corporations are able to really maximize profit off it to the detriment of workers from them. Um, and COVID just exposed that, you know, these norms that nominally, you know, most corporations do say that they are following in practice were not followed, you know, the steps of uh, tracking human rights violations, uh, making sure that they're taking steps to prevent and um, mitigate, you know, impacts before they're even happening, um, just, you know, clearly, clearly did not happen. And so if these norms aren't working in a moment like COVID, where you really want them to work, then I think that really exposes that there's a need for a new way forward. Yeah, I would second all the points that Sarah and Sahiba just made. I would also add Two other points, I think one thing is that consumers also seem to be becoming a lot more aware of their impact on the world and um, kind of just becoming more conscious of, of the types of companies they're buying from and the human rights impacts of those companies. And so I think that's incentivizing a push toward uh, stronger due diligence procedures. The other point that I'll make, I think, is that we've also seen a significant push following France introducing their uh, due diligence law. And I think one thing that's happening is as more countries start to develop these laws, other, want to, other countries also want to be developing them to, so that they're not lagging behind in a human rights framework as well. And um, yeah. that kind of, uh, I think that's a space where sort of competition works well in that um, countries don't want to be lagging behind uh, 
um, uh, in the human rights sense. Mm. And, and in this space, um, a lot of focus, have, there has been a lot of focus on the fashion industry. Um, and do you think, um, Noor, you just mentioned there, the consumer piece, do you think that's one of the, the reasons why the fashion industry has particularly come under kind of focus for, for these types of legislations? Um, I mean, from my perspective, I definitely think that's a part of it because the human, the fashion industry is one that um, is a center of focus. I think everyone is purchasing clothes and I think that makes it a focus kind of for the average consumer more so than other things. Um, I also think that with a lot of, with clothing in particular, brands are a really significant part of kind of um, what of the association with the clothes you're buying so maybe with other products you're not necessarily paying attention as much to the brand that you're purchasing from but with fashion that is definitely the case and so i think that draws a lot more attention to um the supply chain practices of those companies yeah and we're we're seeing a lot of um focus today on mandatory human rights due diligence legislation that's obviously the title of the panel so um, before we go any further, perhaps, Sarah, you could tell us a bit more about this type of legislation. Um, why is it so important and necessary? And what are some of the, the facets of, of really good gold standard mandatory human rights due diligence legislation? Um, sure. Big so, <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's the, this... Um, what what Sahiba said that uh, the human rights due diligence is taking uh, the principles laid out in the UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights and hardening them into law is, is really important because the the sort of uh, source let's say uh, for for uh, mandatory human rights due diligence legislation is the UNGPs and what's so important uh, about the UNGPs there are many things but a key uh, aspect of the UNGPs is that it says all corporations have a responsibility to respect human rights, not just companies, you know, in uh, uh, countries that are maybe where there's maybe less uh, local uh, uh, enforcement of the laws, but all companies that includes the fashion brands that includes you know the buyers um uh, the companies that are buying the the goods that are manufactured uh overseas and all companies have a responsibility to respect human rights and how they discharge that responsibility is that they have to avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impact anywhere in their supply chain um, and this is really important also that cause contribute distinction because cause is sort of very close, right? It's like the person that is not paying the worker their wages or the, the um, employer that is not ensuring that working conditions are safe or the factory floor is adequately ventilated or that there are adequate like fire safety um, measures in place and um, instruments in place. Uh, so that per that entity or person may be seen as causing a human rights uh, adverse impact, but contribute the contribute to uh, prong of of UNGP UN guiding principles on business and human rights uh, type liability goes to also things like the company the buyers uh, in this case purchasing practices. And this is very um, significant because it brings in a much uh, bigger group and a bigger type of uh, corporate activity under the responsibility umbrella. And that is um, taken, that principle of you, can't, you have to avoid causing, contributing, or being linked to um, adverse human rights impacts is what is being enshrined in this mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. So the, the power of it, I think, is that it, by definition, makes everybody responsible for bad things that happen anywhere in their supply chain. Um, and it, it doesn't allow the lead firm or the retailer or the fashion brand to say, oh, we didn't know, 
you know, we didn't see, we didn't hear, we had no idea what was going on, you know, deeper into our supply chain. Uh, we have no way of gathering this information. We have no connection to the harm. They can't anymore say that. Um, and that I think is a crucial, it was a crucial gap, right? That we had uh, with the voluntary measures is that we didn't have a, a sort of um, enforcement power to say, not only are you structurally responsible, but we can hold you accountable if you fail to discharge your responsibilities right. in these supply chains. So. Mm. And, and that's so relevant in fashion supply chains where they can be so vast and span multiple geographic locations and you've got you know several tiers, millions of workers. So I suppose with um, kind of weaker legislative responses, it's very easy for fashion brands to rely on that kind of if they can't see it, it's not happening. Um, but this legislation kind of means that they can't do that. Right, right. right. It takes away that sort of shield of willful blindness, mm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and of course, with, with all legislation, um, it, you know, comes with challenges and barriers. Um, and I think it's really important to reflect on that to kind of over be able to overcome any that exist. So, um, Sahiba, perhaps you can, can reflect a bit on what those challenges and barriers are in relation to mandatory human rights due diligence. Absolutely. Um, well, I think if we talk about, we can talk about the EU um, directive on draft directive on, on due diligence that's out there now. I think, um, you know, one big thing to know is uh, advocates are thinking about their position on the bill is that um, the bill is different from the UNGPs. Um, it's not a it's not just putting into law the UNGPs, and there are some really key distinctions. Um, one is that, uh, for example, the bill does not require all companies to be, um, you know, conducting human rights due diligence. Of course, we'd expect um, EU companies to be covered on the, under the law. There's only certain EU companies that are covered under the law. They have to be of a certain size. Um, in addition, it's only um, certain very large uh, non-EU companies that are doing a significant amount of business in the EU that are under the scope of the law. Um, there's a couple of other um, aspects of the bill that are kind of interesting to think about um, that are different from the UNGPs. Uh, one is that um, the EU bill has, um, for some companies, um, a restricted number or set of human rights that they are um, requiring companies to do due diligence on. Um, so uh, for certain companies that are, um, I believe, a bit smaller than the, um, than the, there's two sets of groups in the bill. There's a set of companies that are a little smaller. Um, it's only severe human rights impacts that they have to be tracking um, and doing due diligence on. Um, and that can actually exclude a lot of the big human rights impacts that we see in global supply chains. Like, um, you know, it's an undefined term what severe human rights impacts are, but oftentimes freedom of association impacts, which are really about workers' ability to, you know, organize collectively, raise um, their voices at the workplace, will not be considered um, severe. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It doesn't affect, you know, all companies in the bill, but it does affect some of them. And the other big area um, to think about with the bill um, compared to the UNGPs is really remedy. Uh, there's not a lot of details about remedy in the bill. Um, and that, um, you know, is one of the key aspects of the UNGPs. It's actually the third pillar. It's, you know, human rights due diligence and then remediation, because a core principle of, of the UNGPs was that every every worker, every human rights holder deserves um, remediation for, for the harms that they're experiencing, um, especially when, you know, they are in the, they're being caused or contributed to or in some way linked to, um, you know, corporations. And, and part of it is that corporations, uh, where necessary, uh, should be playing a role in, in providing that remediation. So um, thinking about, you might think, okay, well, what are, what are remedies? Sometimes it's financial compensation, but sometimes if a worker loses their job because they were organizing, um, they really just want that 
job back. Uh, and we don't know if that's something that, that the, the bill would provide for, for example. So there's a lot of details to be worked out there. Right. And, and one of those details is um, living wage, right? So um, the Fashion Revolution is part of the Good Clothes Fair Pay campaign, which actually just launched yesterday. And we'll go into a bit more detail about that. But the campaign essentially demands um, laws and legislation that pay fairer and living wages for garment workers. So is that an, is living wage um, an element of mandatory human rights due diligence firstly? And um, is why is it so important in this area of work, particularly thinking about um, garment workers? To anyone? No? <laughs> Who wants to go first? I can just jump in um, and, and say that, uh, you know, living wage uh, is, you know, <clears throat> at least I, I think a, a human right that can really be backed up um, with the um, UN, you know, instruments on human rights. Um, but it is, you know, the, the process for in the, in the, you bill for, um, you know, addressing and mitigating human rights impacts is really to put forward, um, you know, to, to use con their contracts, their relationships with suppliers, um, as Sarah was saying, to um, mitigate. And, and it looks like um, the mitigation, which could happen through sort of action plans that um, in some, that could be verified by third party auditors, um, would basically the requirement um, would be satisfied by something, you know, much less than, than, you know, providing living wages. And the, um, you know, the, there's a lot of fuzzy language in the bill um, about like, that, that creates loopholes um, for corporations. Right. We can imagine that, um, you know, human rights due diligence should require all uh, corporations to be paying living wages if they were actually tracking the human rights impacts in their supply chains. But in practice, the way it's written in the bill, um, that's, that's, that's not what we, how we would expect the bill to be enforced, I would say. Right. And I guess also often there's, there's a gap between what companies report themselves and, and the reality in terms of um, what garment workers in factories might report around their realities. And, and I guess living wage would, would be one of those gaps potentially. Um, so we know that mandatory human rights due diligence started in Europe and Sahiba, you've told us a bit there about the, um, the European directive, which um, gives a, a great bit of hope that we're gonna see even more progress in this area. Um, but Noor, perhaps you could reflect a bit on the American perspective. Um, I know there are alternative legal strategies and frameworks there and it'd be great to, to hear a bit more about those. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I'll start by saying that I think the movement in Europe has had a really significant influence on Americans in terms of pursuing stronger due diligence laws. And there have been a number of different initiatives kind of pursued here, some kind of mirroring or, or uh, kind of um, so, sort of with a lot of similarities to the European approach, others that take very different approaches to the European approach. And I think there's a lot of debate on um, which approach folks prefer. Um, I think one issue that we've been seeing is, um, I think one issue we've been seeing sort of generally in, in, in the space is that there are a lot of laws being introduced or proposed that are focused on disclosure and transparency. And while that's really vital, it's not human rights due diligence. And so, I mean, one example of this is um, the California Supply Chain Transparency Act which, uh, uh, which, which allows companies to uh, report on uh, information regarding due diligence work that they do, but then doesn't hold companies accountable or doesn't have, include any um, liability regimes for companies that don't engage in due diligence. They just simply say that they don't have any due diligence to report on. And so that's, a, and I think the impetus for laws like that is to, uh, sort of pressure companies to engage in due diligence. So the idea is that if a company is not engaging in due diligence and saying that we don't have anything to report, it might 
reflect poorly upon them, but what we're seeing is that that's actually not the case. And so um, as laws like, uh, we've seen kind of a couple of examples of laws similar in nature being introduced what, under the guise of sort of human rights due diligence, but when you actually take a look at those, um, that it's not actually human rights due diligence, it's um, another take on disclosure laws. And one example of this is something that Sarah was actually also really involved in is, um, or sorry, involved in sort of um, supporting with amending was uh, a law introduced by Senator Biaggi and Assemblywoman Kellis in New York called the New York Fashion Supply Chain, Act, or sorry, New York Fashion Sustainability Act, which was another example of a law that um, kind of focused on disclosure as opposed to um, actual due diligence. And so that's kind of one concern that we've been seeing that said there have been a couple of approaches that have been successful and are moving forward. Um, one example is the California Garment Worker Protection Act, which uh, holds companies jointly and severally liable for wage theft in their supply chains. Um, that does only apply in California, but then more recently, um, a sort of fe federal version of that was introduced called the Fabric Act. Um, which does a similar thing. Um, so I think the, that one only applies domestically in the US. And so what that means is that workers throughout supply chains in different countries don't get to benefit from this law. And so um, one thing that's kind of come out of that is a push um, that we are involved in as well as other um, NGOs and other activists in developing something similar that would apply internationally and would also cover workers abroad. Um, and so that's sort of one example of another approach to this. Um, there are a couple of other efforts that we've that we're sort of conscious of. Um, Senator Ossoff is also working on a proposal that um, closely mirrors the European due diligence directive, but is focused on forced labor specifically. Um, and so that's also an, another thing that's sort of floating around in the US space. Um, Specifically, we at ICAR are um, working on a legislative proposal that would um, kind of take the approach of mirroring the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is a anti-corruption, anti-bribery law um, that passed in the US in the 70s and has been really successful at curbing corruption among US companies around the world. And so um, there has been a discussion for a really long time around including human rights within the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, especially because corruption and human rights abuses often take place in tandem when, when you see like often around um, companies that are held accountable under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, if you look closely, you'll find that there are also human rights abuses tied to that corrupt practice. And so we are working on a proposal that would, that we're calling the FCPA for human rights. So essentially would, um, mirror sort of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, but would be targeted toward uh, prohibiting human rights abuses throughout the supply chains of American companies or companies that are operating in the US. And um, it, that includes prohibitions of human rights abuses that are included in US law, as well as the 1998 ILO declaration. And then also includes a reporting requirement uh, requiring companies to report on the, human right, on the human rights due diligence and then any remediation efforts that they take. Um, I think one concern with the FCPA for human rights is that it doesn't currently include a remedy. So companies that might violate it would be held account, would, would have to pay penalties or fines, but then the, the victims and the survivors of those abuses don't really get anything out of it. And so that's one challenge that we're hoping to remedy right now. And that could include either creating a right to sue those companies for victims or an alternative would be um, a community fund that penalties would go into and then that money can later be used to support those victims. So those are a few, that's sort of the direction where a few mm -hmm. of um, the initiatives in the US are taking and I'll, I'll leave it there. Right, thank you. Sarah, sorry. Sorry, no, um, I, it's so helpful to hear Noor uh, say this. And I just wanted to, to um, to add a little, because I'm not sure that we've actually talked about the what of human rights due diligence, like what it actually is. And 
the, it, it helps contextualize, I think, what, what Nora has, has offered, because these are alternative right modes mm -hmm. of, of regulating corporate conduct. Um, disclosure regimes like the California Supply Chains Act is really just asking, as Nora said, you know, companies to say, do you have a human rights policy? Do you have a due diligence process in place? And there's no consequence if you say, no, I don't do anything about human rights. Yeah. Right? Uh, so it's just disclosure and the idea is that like, you know, making companies disclose will somehow uh, maybe shame them or press others to uh, to to um, exert their leverage on the company so that it changes its behavior. That's a very uh, unreliable model, as as Nor as Nor explained. Um, and it's very different from the human rights due diligence model, which is basically a uh, uh, a regime that asks, uh, requires the company to take steps to identify any human rights risks anywhere in its supply chain. As, as Sahiba said, you know, severity matters and, um, you know, you prioritize in order of severity, but you, are ha you have to identify, you have to do your homework, take a deep dive, see what's going on in there. And then where you identify risks, you have to take affirmative measures to mitigate uh, and um, address those risks to prevent them from materializing into a human rights harm. And if there is a human rights harm, you have an obligation to remedy it, right? Uh, so, and so it kind of covers human rights due diligence in principle, and as Sahiba very well, you know, uh, reminded us, uh, the, the draft EU directive doesn't directly uh, translate the UNGPs into hard law. There are many mismatches that are very concerning and problematic, but in theory, right, and at least I think this aspect of the theory is there in the draft EU directive, um, human rights due diligence does a lot of like, the emphasis is really on preventing the harm. Right. And having um, and having processes and measures in place that you can demonstrate, document, uh, that you have taken mm -hmm. to try and prevent the harm uh, from from arising in the first place, which right. is very different from other models that that Nora described, which kind of kick in only after a bad thing has happened. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point around the kind of consequences as well for if you're only mandating companies to to simply report on um, issues rather than to actually prevent and protect. Um, the, the extent to which they take that legislation seriously rather than kind of a box ticking activity um, comes into question. So that links really nicely to some um, research that we did at Walk Free earlier this year, um, where we were looking at garment company um, responses to Modern Slavery Act um, legislation in the UK and Australia. Um, so again, that's legislation that's not um, mandatory human rights due diligence, so it's more around that duty to report. And um, as you'll know, there's no consequences for non-reporting. Um, so what we found was the, the overwhelming majority of companies um, in the assessment did actually publish a modern slavery statement, which on the surface is great. But then only 31% of those met the mandatory publication criteria. Um, and certainly for, for UK legislation, um, that criteria is, is very basic. Um, we also found that 65% that of companies that we, we looked into um, identified risks in their supply chains, but only 25% of those actually reported incidents, which we know just can't be reflective of reality. Um, knowing, you know, how many risks of modern slavery risks there are in garment supply chains. Um, and maybe most disturbing of all for a reporting process that kind of is based on transparency was that a quarter of companies didn't disclose any information at all on their supply chains. So it kind of brings into question how legislation can really protect um, workers that, that it's designing to protect when companies won't even report on the geographic location of those workers, they're, you know, they're, they're not visible to the legislation because they're not visible to the companies in their reporting. So um, this research also included some of the, the world's biggest luxury fashion brands, so those that you would expect have, you know, a great deal of resource to put behind a really effective response. 
So it was um, it was a, a disappointing findings, and I guess I'm just interested to hear whether there um, whether you've seen that in your work, whether you're surprised by those findings, or whether it's it's something that you would expect. Um, sadly, and how we can ensure that companies do take legislation that is currently in place more seriously. That's to anyone. <laughs> can I just ask you a question, Abby? Um, yeah. Following up on the, the, this. Um, so for the companies that either mm -hmm. failed to report uh, altogether or failed to report in a way that was, um, you know, meeting the requirements of the legislation, any consequence at all? No, no, no consequence at all. And um, out of there were three companies um, in our sample that, that didn't um, produce a statement at all. And mm. two of those were, were two of the biggest luxury fashion brands um, in the world. So, you know, you would think if there would be consequences in terms of reputational damage or, um, or fines, you know, this would be something that that would be leveled at these companies and really they could be made an example of um, and that's just not what we saw so really disappointing but I guess mandatory human rights due diligence legislation um, does build in more of, of a consequence is that right so so perhaps we would see a better uptake or more meaningful uptake of the legislation under that type of, of legislation is, is that right? I mean, I have thoughts on this, but I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm actually very curious to hear, Sahiba, like if you if you have faith in in mandatory human rights due diligence as an accountability tool as compared with uh, disclosure. <laughs> I I mean, uh, I definitely think it is better than disclosure for the exact reasons that you're pointing out in this study. And the study is, you know, really effective in illustrating the limitations of disclosure. Um, when you were uh, explaining, you know, the reporting of incidences, it reminded me um, how much of a burden there is on um, workers, on um, other people who are impacted by human rights abuses to really be advocating with brands, getting in touch with them, putting together evidence about what's happened, you know, going through that, the whole process um, to just make sure, you know, make make their voices heard about an incident that's happening, um, you know, in a company's supply chain. Um, and, you know, having seen that firsthand multiple times, I know that, you know, it takes a lot of work um, for, for workers and unions. Um, and it often, you know, the lived experience of those unions and workers is very different from what companies are tracking um, or what you can get from a written record about what's happening in a factory. Uh, and so for that reason, you know, I am really concerned about the role of third party auditors in the human rights uh, due diligence bill um, or the, the proposed directive at the EU, because uh, you know, if companies are going to use third party auditors, which we know, especially in the fashion industry, but in so many other contexts, really um, are not effective at producing reliable information about what's happening in supply chains, um, then that means that the due diligence exercise that they're doing and their obligations to really be effectively tracking um, effectively tracking human rights abuses in their supply chain is not going to happen. And so uh, the whole process of this human rights due diligence could really be at odds with what the reality is of, of what's yeah. happening in a, in a supply chain. And that kind of undermines the, the purpose of, of, you know, ultimately um, preventing and then remediating human rights abuses. Mm, that's a really interesting point. Um, and I'm just thinking around kind of in addition to the legislation in this area, how can campaigning um, work to, to kind of strengthen um, the changes that we want to see in this area? And I'm particularly thinking about any campaigns that your organisations are working on um, that you could maybe tell us a bit more about and, and what the asks of those are. No campaigns? <laughs> Well, we can, I'll, in, in the asks at the end, I'll, I'll reflect on the, 
um, the good clothes fair pay campaign again. So that can kind of be one of one of our asks. But um, with an all female panel um, here today, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that this is a gendered issue. Um, so modern slavery in general is a, is a gendered issue. One in every 130 people living, um, one in every 130 females globally is living in modern slavery. And um, women and girls account for 71% of all victims of modern slavery worldwide. So this really is a global uh, a gendered issue. Um, and I wondered if any of you had any reflections on um, why human rights abuses in the fashion industry disproportionately affect women. No. <laughs> I guess this uh, kind of thinking around um, are, are women more likely to work in certain tiers of the fashion industry where um, modern slavery risks are greater. So kind of in those, um, the, the depths of the fashion industry tiers where then they're not being recognized by companies and they're more likely to work in kind of forms of employment that might infringe upon their, their rights. Yeah. Yeah, I can speak to that a bit. I think um, it's so true that women are you know, the dominant workforce of fashion period, because we know that, you know, workers in global supply chains are the, the dominant workforce in, in global fashion. Um, and the reasons for that, uh, you know, can be traced and are really structural. So, um, you know, when uh, the industrial fashion industry came into many factories, you know, the preference has really been for hiring women. Um, and we see that women, you know, across the globe um, are heavily concentrated in jobs um, that are precarious, that are poorly paid, whether that's the yeah. service sector, whether that's domestic mm -hmm. work, or whether that's fashion supply chains. Um, and in, in several countries, um, you know, there was real preference for hiring women because there was a perception that they weren't the primary breadwinners so that they could be paid less. There was a right. perception that they're able to, you know, on the basis of stereotypes, that they're easier to control at the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in so many countries, you know, there really is a um, industry-wide, um, and this is happening across multiple, you know, countries, so really globally, uh, a sectoral structure in global garment manufacturing where supervisors are, are men and shop floor workers are women. Um, and that's what really has led together with precarious work and a real culture of impunity at so many factories um, to a culture of gender-based violence and harassment at the mm. workplace. Um, and that really is traceable directly to purchasing practices that are um, pushing pr production targets really high, that are pushing wages really low, um, and that are creating uh, a situation where um, supervisors are, you know, male supervisors are in that role of, of pushing female workers to extremely, um, you know, just impossible production targets and, and gender-based violence and harassment is a key way that management is, um, you know, trying to, trying to get those production targets that are, are so clearly, uh, so clearly start with, with global yeah. fashion companies, you know, contracts. That, that's really interesting and just kind of reflecting on how that's present at all kind of levels of the, the fashion industry and beyond. And I think recognizing that intersectionality um, is so important. And I'll, um, I'll ask people at Fashion Rev to, to share in the chat. We, um, at Walk Free, we did a report called Stacked Odds, looking into why modern slavery um, disproportionately affects women. So there's, there's some kind of further discussion in there that um, people might be interested in looking at. Um, but finally, I think it's important to end on, um, we, we touched on it a bit at the beginning, but um, how consumers can have positive kind of power in bringing about change. So it's brilliant to see all of this legislative change and developments in this area. But what can we also do as everyday consumers of the fashion industry, which, you know, we, we all are to some extent, how can we really um, ensure that, that we're doing that ethically and, and kind of being part of the solution as consumers? Mm 
I'm kind of thinking around like, oh, sorry, were you, were you gonna say something, Sarah? Oh, sorry, uh, wait, what were you kind of thinking around, sorry? <laughs> Um, well, I'm thinking one key point would be around our voting power. So um, looking at, at how um, at different policies and, and how they're being um, part of the solution in this area and how we can look into policy and how we vote on that. Um, and also, obviously, uh, just how we buy, putting pressures on brands, saying that that we care about the people that make our clothes and we're demanding um, that there's transparency around how they're treated, their human rights, um, and, and being part of the solution that way, maybe in that applying pressure. Would, would you say that's a good, a good tactic? Um, I, you know, I had a thought as you were talking about the, the disappointments of the UK Modern Slavery Act. It's a, you know, the UK Modern Slavery Act uh, came after the California Supply Chain Transparency Act. Uh, I don't know if it, it was the same uh, with the UK Modern Slavery Act, but certainly with the California Supply Chains mm -hmm. Act, the idea was that you wanted to equip, it was designed to equip consumers with information, right? To enable consumers to make decisions about where they were purchasing, what companies they were purchasing from in a way that could better align with their own values, right? Yeah. And it seems to me like the law fails pretty spectacularly at like equipping consumers with the type of information that would actually allow them to inform their yeah. own purchasing decisions in this way. Um, and so part of what I wonder is like, would it make sense for consumers to more clearly articulate what is the information that would be yeah. more useful? Um, and, 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 then, and then to think strategically about, well, and how would you use it? There's, of yeah. course, a sort of boycott. You know, I just am not going to buy for the, from this company anymore. There's the boycott, right? Of like, I'm going to favor this company because I like mm -hmm. what, it's telling me about its supply chain. Um, and there's another uh, avenue which some consumers in the in the US have explored, and I, I don't know if the same has been true overseas, which is to bring uh, false advertising claims. So companies, you know, consumer protection claims, basically, um, saying, you know, Company X, you say that you are a pioneer when it comes mm. to ensuring there are no sweatshops and you are in your supply chain or, you know, that you care so much about human rights, but then your practices show otherwise. Um, yeah. This constitutes a lot of greenwashing. Of consumer, right? Yeah, greenwashing yeah. that creates a sort of consumer deception yeah. problem. Um, and of course, you know, as, as Sahiba was saying, you know, there, there's all kinds of issues with like, you know, mounting a legal claim, but if consume, you know, resources and, you know, getting lawyers and all this mm -hmm. to do that. But, but if consumers unite in this way, um, through, for example, I don't know, like national consumer organizations to bring claims against companies for fair washing, uh, yeah. maybe not so much green washing, but fair washing, um, maybe that's an avenue that, you know, Companies respond to litigation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's good to, to kind of end on that piece of there's something that we can all be doing um, and, and kind of having that positive mindset of, you know, we can also be part of the, the change here. Um, but I'm mindful of the time and it's, it's such an interesting discussion. I feel like we could have it for a lot longer, but we are um, almost at time now. So... Um, before we go into the a, a quick q and I think we only um, will have time for one or two, but um, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for joining our Fashion Citizenship kickoff panel. Um, I hope you found it as interesting a discussion as I have. Um, and to conclude, we just want to, to highlight three calls um, for our Fashion Revolution USA community um, and what actions um, you can take as a result of, of this panel and what we've been discussing. So. Firstly, um, we'd love you to learn about the, the campaigns, the work of, of all of the organisations um, that are present here um, and follow their work. Um, 
And secondly, I've mentioned the, the Good Clothes Fair Pay campaign um, that's kicked off this week and they're aiming to collect one million signatures this summer to demand a living wage legislation all around the world. So that's definitely worth taking a look at and supporting. Um, and finally, with all these panels, we hope as an individual, you become more engaged and learn about the laws and policies affecting your communities um, and learn about fashion policy to support legislation that builds an ethical and sustainable fashion industry. Um, so they're, they're the kind of three actions that I thought we could conclude on. Um, I don't know whether any of the panelists have any to add there or have I covered it all? Great. Um, so we might have time for one or two questions. Um, let me just see in the chat. Um, so someone's asked here, what is the best thing individuals can do to support mandatory human rights due diligence legislation? Any reflections there? Can I pick up on the piece that is, am I muted? No. Um, before that question, oh, yeah, sure. and, yeah. and I'd love to hear um, Noren and Sahiba's views too. Um, of like, what are some of, what are some reasons um, for fashion for brands and corporations to support MHRDD legislation when it would increase requirements for them? Um, I think that's such a important question. One one way that we um, as part of the um, this uh, contracting project that that I was mentioning at the outset, think about this is to say it's about effectiveness, right? So, like a lot of corporations have uh, human rights policies on their books and say that they're committed, you know, because they want to attract uh, more. Uh, consumers and also more investors that they're committed to doing well socially, right? To performing mm -hmm. well on ESG um, uh, objectives, um, and um, you you can't do that unless you do good human rights due diligence. You you completely undermine uh, any sort of, of the public facing commitments to upholding human rights if you don't take active measures to ensure in an ongoing way uh, that you are in fact having the procedures and um, measures in place to address and improve uh, human rights performance. So you can say everything you want in your advertising or your websites or your yeah. corporate governance documents, et cetera. But if you don't do well on MHRDD, um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna be effective and you're gonna risk losing uh, investors, consumers, yeah. and taking all kinds of reputational hits. That's I, I, well, no, I think that's great, Sarah. I was also going to add, I think one other key thing is that some companies do do that work on their own. They do ensure that their supply chains are sustainable and that they're human rights conscious. And what ends up happening is that those companies are disadvantaged by the fact that they're putting money into right. this, whereas other companies are not. Those other companies are employing forced labor or they have human trafficking in their supply chain and that acts as a subsidy to a certain extent. It gives them an advantage in the market because they're putting less money toward ensuring that human rights, that they are human rights conscious in their supply chains. And so for a lot of companies, that's a big reason why they support this because they say mm -hmm. we already do this work, we're committed toward it and it puts us at a disadvantage and we don't want these other companies to be profiting and surpassing us because they're not doing these things. Right. So creating a, a level playing field, I guess. Yeah. And that's a lot the ambition of the EU directive is to harmonize yeah. across the EU because there are these different legislations and they impact corporations differently. Yeah. Yeah, you can end up in situations of patchwork legislation and, and obviously that's not what we want, particularly given the complexity of, of garment supply chains. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think the more there is, um, you know, especially in the fashion industry, um, there's so much responding to crisis, you know, people, companies don't do their due diligence, and there's crises that they have to be responding to. And the more they're actively, you know, stakeholders in their supply chains, you know, including labor, um, and, and sort of building that in from the outset. Um, I think the more likely it is that you can build um, a, a sustained voice um, for labor that is consistent with the freedom of association, for example, values that 
all of these companies do say that they they stand by. Mm. So predictability, you know, in, in supply chain management, I think would be key. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. Um, and we're, we're almost at the end of time, um, the end of time, the end of um, the time we have for this panel now. Um, but a final question was just, um, I guess, to bring everything together. So um, a final thought on why does policy matter and how can legislation shape communities and society? I mean, okay, so I, you, I can take a, a stab at that. The legislation matters because it creates consequences, right? right. Um, and this is really what's been lacking until um, very recently is that there haven't really been consequences for, for poor um, corporate conduct. And, yeah. and legislation, as we were just saying, you know, also serves the purpose of creating a level playing field. If everybody knows yeah. the rules and is playing by the same rules, they're yeah. more likely to follow them, especially if they know, uh, as Nor was saying, that like someone isn't going to be taking advantage of a, 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 yeah. a normless uh, space um, to, to their own competitive disadvantage. So I think it, you know, we, I wish that we didn't need law, um, but we do. And, yeah. uh, and I think things are heading in the right direction, even if, yeah. um, even if, you know, I totally agree that the EU directive has a lot of issues with it so far. Um, I think the movement is toward a, a normative upgrading that mm -hmm. is, you know, pretty much hitting everybody mm -hmm. across the board in a, in a, in a promising way. Right. Yeah, I think we can we can hope to see more and more positive developments in this area, definitely. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to, to our panellists um, for such a powerful conversation. I think it's been really thought provoking and I hope everyone um, goes away and, and has a look at some of the links we've shared in the chat today um, and, and thinks more about this, this really important topic. Um, but that, that's it for now. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you so Thank much. you. Thank you.